right, I think people are filtering in here now, so I think we'll get started. Um, welcome to Perennia's Virtual Field Days. This is our second one. We had one yesterday as well. Um, I'm Caitlin Condon. I'm the Acting Vegetable Specialist, um, and we're going to get rolling here. So a little bit of housekeeping for Zoom before we get started. Um, all participants have their audio and video turned off, so don't worry, you're not going to spontaneously jump onto our screen or anything. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and uh, we will have a question and answer period at the end of the session. So please put your questions in there for those, but you can type them in at any time. Um, so the chat and the Q&A will be monitored prior to the Q&A session at the end. We are playing some videos here today. Um, if your videos lag a bit at the beginning, don't panic. <laughs> that uh, seems to be a little bit of a side effect of putting video, piping videos through Zoom. So they should smooth out pretty quickly. So today's virtual field day, um, the topics we're going to cover are methods of strawberry production and vertical farming and container growing. We have some great panelists here with us today. Um, Talia Plaskett is our protected crop specialist here at Perennia, and Jenna Haverstock is the manager for horticulture. Joining us today, we also have Jackson Lohr and Phil Hatcher, who are both producers. Uh, we are going to get started and, oh, no, sorry, actually, <laughs> later this week. Uh, tomorrow we have weed management. Um, we're going to talk about weed management in a number of different horticultural crops. So please join us for that as well. Okay, now we're going to get started. So we're going to start off today um, with strawberry production systems with Talia. Hi everyone, my name is Talia. Uh, I'm the new protected crop specialist here at Perennia. And today we're gonna to be looking at some of the production systems that are in use across Nova Scotia. Let's get started. Today we are gonna look at two methods of strawberry production. To start, we will look at a modified outdoor production system. As with traditional production, the plants have been planted along the tops of raised hills. One of the first things we notice here is that the hills and the spaces between them are covered in black ground cover. This creates a barrier between the soil and the substrate that the plants are going to be planted in. The next thing we see is that a depression or trough has been created down the center of each bed, which creates a growing space for the root system of the plants. Instead of planting in soil, as you would in a traditional system, Jackson has planted into soilless substrate. The plants will now grow for two, maybe three years. Plants and substrates will then be removed and replaced for the next growing cycle. There is additional time required to get the system in place. However, there are many benefits associated with this production method. The berries themselves stay much cleaner in this type of system compared to growing in soil. Jackson experiences a lot of positive reviews from the UPIC customers about the conditions of the berries and the field while picking. Another benefit to this system would be that you get a head start on the growing season compared to a traditional planting. The black material will warm the entire below ground system, protecting against the cooler temperatures experienced at the beginning and the end of the growing season. One of the biggest advantages of using this soilless substrate is the increased control when it comes to root disease. Replanting fields year after year can result in high disease, pest, and nematode populations. By planting in substrate and covering potential sources of inoculum, your risk of continuous disease year after year is significantly reduced. And you don't have to worry about crop rotation or expensive soil treatments. Once your two to three year growing cycle is finished, you dispose of the substrate and can start again on a clean slate. Soilless substrates are a blank slate in terms of fertigation, as well as diseases and pests. 
Instead of having to worry about the profile of the growing soil, you will be able to directly supplement the nutrients that the plants need and quickly make adjustments where necessary. What that means is less stress overall in terms of counteracting high nutrient or pH levels in your existing soil or having to worry about long-term viability of your soil. We also see a significant reduction in weed pressure as a result of reducing the amount of space for the plants to grow. For the weeds that do grow, removing them is much easier due to the limited volume of growing substrate. For you, that means less money spent on herbicides and less time spent spraying compared to a traditional system. Here is a quick shot of what weed pressure can look like in an uncovered hill. In a situation where you have limited help to go through and control the weeds, this substrate method works well at reducing weed growth. Now the second piece associated with trying these raised substrate beds is deciding which substrate you'd like to use. Substrates differ in their water holding capacity. The most suitable substrate for you will depend on your watering habits, your irrigation system capacity, and the crop that you're growing. Jackson is experimenting with three different combinations here. One of them is strictly peat, the next is a cocoa coir and peat mix, and third is a cocoa coir, peat, and vermiculite mix. This batch of plants will allow him to experiment with these three options and see what works best for him in this particular system. The cost associated with the various materials you can include in your substrate will vary, so it's worth experimenting to see what are going to give you a good result or not. It's also important to consider the disposal of these various methods. Some things might be able to be composted while others are not. Now we're going to take a step back from field production and we're going to go take a look at an indoor strawberry production system. So we are currently in Jackson Lore's hoop house where he has been producing strawberries. So there are quite a few differences um, compared to a traditional outdoor planting or compared to the planting that we just saw. Instead of planting on raised hills, in this system we see that the plants have been planted into planters and placed on troughs which have been raised off the ground. Each trough has been raised about four and a half feet off the ground, creating a highly ergonomic workspace and a more enjoyable experience for laborers and you pick customers that visit the farm. The plants are housed in planters, specifically sized for the width of this particular trough. Each planter is then filled with a soilless substrate and watered via drip irrigation. This system sees a lot of the same benefits as the raised substrate hills. The major difference being that the crop is protected from uncertain and unpredictable outdoor conditions. Rain, hail, wind, and insect damage is significantly reduced compared to an uncovered operation, which ultimately leads to a higher marketable yield for the grower. The plants are also protected from early frost periods and as a result have an extended growing season compared to a strictly outdoor operation. Jackson is able to grow more delicate varieties of berries in these tun tunnels as well, knowing that they would not be subject to harsh outdoor conditions. This adds variety to what is available on the market and also attracts customers who are looking for these more specialty varieties. An important thing to keep in mind when growing indoors is ventilation and air circulation. We can see here that Jackson has fans running constantly to make sure that the air is always moving and can roll up the sides of his structure to allow some of that other air inside as well. I want to thank you guys for tuning into our video and encourage you to reach out if you are interested in Yeah, that, was a great look. <laughs> that was a great look at uh, some interesting strawberry production systems. Um, up next, we're going to follow along with Kalia as she visits Very Local Greens. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our virtual field days. Um, I'm standing with the Halifax Harbor behind me, and we are going to check out Very Local Greens. 
have behind us here? We have two of my farms. Um, they're purpose-built shipping containers uh, that were designed just inside of Boston that I'm growing mainly leafy greens and herbs in. Awesome. Um, and where did you purchase these from? These, um, these are from a company called Freight Farm uh, in Boston. They're kind of one of the manufacturers globally. It's probably a hand dozen, a, hand, a dozen or so <laughs> um, different companies that are kind of working in this sector. So they come fully outfitted then yep. uh, when you purchase these? Then. Yeah, pretty much. There's um, some modifications. And I've done quite a bit of modifications over the last couple of years, just uh, just after I've grown them for long enough, just tweaking certain things and adding things and um, some maintenance back upgrades and all the stuff that went wrong. What do you like about this system and this sort of farming? Um, I think I, I originally kind of really was intrigued by the technology. I mean, my background is more on the tech side of things than the plant side of things. Um, so just seeing, you know, how the systems work and um, the automation side. Of things. So. All right, guys. So we're actually going to now head into the storage unit and take a closer look at what we've got. Hey, I'm Phil, uh, owner and operator of Very Local Greens, and I'm going to give you guys a little rundown on just my workflow and um, a bit of a tour of the farm. So this is actually our kind of complete work surface, work desk. We propagate in this area and this is where our seedlings are grown. So. so we actually um, seed, we propagate down here for a week and then our seedlings move up into this area. A tray of basil babies, kind of about a week away, maybe, uh, from going in our main growing area. And what is the substrate that you're growing in? This, the substrate is um, just a cocoa core peat moss mixture. So they have a, a bit of a binding agent with them as well, too. So you can see some roots starting to poke through there. And they're designed more or less so when they go into this particular system, there's no real particles or no dirt particles that drop off them. Um, so they're pretty clean. Mm -hmm. This is some swisher that's going to be going as well too. The spectrum we're using is a, a blue-red combination, um, which is lacking green. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting once you're looking at it, and then you look at anything else, all you can see is what's lacking, which is green. Once we get the seedlings to the size that we're showing you, then we actually move them into our gr main growing area. The towers that we grow in are these. These are kind of a simple plastic design with a foam interior. And we plant inside them and more or less uh, our nutrient water flows from the top, passes by the root all the way down through, back into this trough and back to our tank. So it's just, it's a closed loop. Every time this plant has the exact same amount of sunlight, the exact same amount of water, like we really have to keep to a schedule. And that's one thing with this particular type of farming is, is you create your spreadsheet and you stick with it because if you divert from it, it just builds up. <laughs> Honestly, like even though you think, okay, I could get a little bit more out of this crop or I could get a little bit more time or I could let this go, you need, you need the new plants growing to get you to where you are. Being able to change those elements to better every grow, you know what I mean? We learn from every grow and we, if we, we think the watering um, cycle could be changed a little bit, we'll, we'll calculate and see if we can make those changes. Not only do you have the increased ability to control your climate in this sort of system, you also have capacity to store previous data points. I'm going to attract CO2 
um, related to uh, when my CO2 generator was turning on, related to air temperature and humidity. Wow. So it'll it'll cross reference all of those in a graph to tell me exactly like what was happening. So that's amazing. Yeah, so my CO2 levels, like obviously that's when someone was in the farm. I can tell when people go in the farm just with the high CO2 levels, but I can also tell like when my generator's been on. Um, and yeah, you can cross reference with everything. Um, but it's kind of neat to be able to track that back. Since COVID, we decided we're going to find one farm specifically for basil. Um, so this one has been dialed in, you know, for the exact humidity and temperature and watering cycle for basil. And we've tried different varieties of basil as well too. Um, this is just strictly straight up Genovese basil. So no kind of, <laughs> there's a million different basil seeds on the market right now, um, but this is straight up Genovese from Johnny Seeds. We've sold this um, root on, pulled the whole thing out root on to restaurants. Um, we're mainly doing a trim and then we'll, you know, wait a number of weeks to do another cut. Um, but it really depends on what the customer is looking for. Growing indoors allows you to take control of a lot of the external variables that play a factor in farming. By maintaining a climate which is suitable for your plants, you're allowing the plants to optimize their growth and increase their defenses against any pests or pathogens that may get into the system. In addition to the increased control over diseases and pests, you also have a higher degree of reliability with your crop. You know exactly how much of your product you will be pulling out and exactly the day that it will be ready, every single time. All right, so that about wraps up our tour for today. I wanna to say thank you for joining us on our tour of Very Local Greens. And if you have any questions, please stick around for the question and answer period that's coming up next. See you there. All right, what a great tour. So now we have our question and answer period. So if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, but for now, I'm gonna get things kicked off with a question for Phil. Uh, so Phil, I'm wondering, other than ba the basil that we saw in the video, what else are you growing in your shipping containers? Um, I've kind of tried, it feels like I've almost tried everything, every leafy green. Um, but so yeah, one, like I mentioned, one container is dialed in just for basil. The other basil, or the other container right now, I have four different varieties of lettuce, three different varieties of kale. I have some cilantro, I have some edible flowers, some red vein sorrel, and what else? Um, some other, actually some specialty basil. So I have some Thai basil and some lime basil currently, but I've tried <laughs> everything. <laughs> Lots of variety. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And, and Phil, how are you, I guess, deciding on these varieties? Is it just things that you like to grow or based on what people are asking for? Uh, more what's or part less, of that process? More or less probably for the first six months. It was just trial and error for me to get up to speed of how, um, how things like to grow and what crops grew well. Um, that balanced with, with obviously the market. So when I started, I was doing mainly direct to restaurants. So I was trying to build some relationships with some, some different chefs. Um, and I'd be trying some, um, really trying to trial some things that w weren't easily obtainable, um, for them locally. Um, and now that slowly, you know, switched over to depending upon, um, if I was selling at the farmer's market or selling to retail, um, more or less tweaking that crop to more or less make sense to take up the real estate in the farm. I only have so much space. So it's really just crunching the numbers and kind of going in reverse to say like, what's going to sell and uh, what's, what has a value to it. And um, did you find that there were some things that just didn't grow well in sort of a vertical system or was it more just, you know, it was, oh, you're, you're breaking up there a little bit. Breaking up a bit. <laughs> you're breaking up, but I think, I, I, think I, I know the question, was there stuff that did, just didn't grow well? Um, 
Yeah, certain things, certain things definitely grow better than others. I, I never really push the ver like push the push the limit, you know, trying to grow things away from the leafy green and away from things that I knew. But I mean, I've grown, um, I grew fennel, I've grown radishes, like I've grown things that, that, that do have a root to them as well. Um, certain things too. I mean, you got, you have to, you have to play around with plants that all kind of want the same nutrient, um, delivered to them as well too. So I've had certain things where I'm like, yeah, I've, that plant really wants more of this than I'm willing to kind of, um, I'm, I'm not willing to sacrifice the other plants to try and make that one grow well. So are they all on the same system then in one container? They are. So each container kind of has two systems I can control. I can control the seedling area um, separately from the main grow area, but I can't. So, so my whole main grow area has to run on the same watering schedule and the same nutrient makeup. So I'm limited. And that's why having multiple farms, you can start to play around with, with different makeups. Um, we have a question here about uh, the costs, um, the fertilizer costs and the costs to run. Yep. Um, sorry, my dog's just barking outside. Trying to make sure. <laughs> um, the fertilizer costs, uh, for, for me, it's fairly minimal. Um, so obviously it's all hydroponic and, um, it's, it, it's fairly, it's fairly minimal. I mean, I have a 140 gallon reservoir, so a fairly large reservoir tank, um, but it's all recirculated. So I've played around with different, um, different manufacturers and, um, it's, yeah, it's fairly minimal. Okay. That's, that's really interesting. Um, we have another question from the participants. Uh, what is the biggest challenge in vertical production? Um, I'd say the biggest challenge is just trying to lay out your design of what you're going to grow um, and just crop rotations and trying to make sure that your, you know, your seedlings are, are in that rotation and kind of have really how to maximize your space. Um, and just making sure that obviously you have a market for everything. Um, like I mentioned in the video, it's, there's no real pause button. And it's kind of like, because you're in a, you have such a limited space, it's the seedlings are supposed to go in at a certain time and that plant's supposed to go at a certain time. So there's, there's, it's, it's fairly demanding that way of having a, having a schedule for, for stuff in and out. I mean, I know that it's like that for, for everyone, you, if you're, if you're planting multiple crops, but, um, but especially for, especially for when you only have 320 square feet you're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a, a, a small space, but you're managing it very intensively. Um, so we have some more questions for Phil coming in, but I think we're just going to jump over to Jackson for a few minutes um, and then we'll come back. So where did the idea uh, for the, the substrate in the field growing come from? If you can get them unmuted here. Oh, there you we go. Hear me? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. We went over to, to the Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany in the fall of 2018 with the North American Strawberry Growers Association. And uh, over there, I found that I didn't see any strawberries grown in the ground anymore. Every, everything seems to be done in substrate. And with the problems we have now with um, root diseases because of the cold wet springs that seems to be associated with climate change, I thought this might be a way to uh, get around that. That's what got me interested. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Jackson, what were some of the differences that you noticed uh, about those raised substrate hills compared to a traditional system? Some of the benefits, you mean? Um, yes, yeah. Well, well one, of, one of the big things is, which is becoming a big problem, I think in a lot of areas in the province, is uh, root diseases like black root rot, which is associated with climate change and also cropping on the same ground for a number of years. And 
this is a way to get around that. And the other thing is, especially for maybe a small scale farm operation, you can have all the available fields that you have that you have in production every year without the need of going through crop rotation. And this is a big benefit if you don't have a lot of acres to work with because um, with the way I think a lot of it has to do with climate change now, you have to do longer rotation periods. Also, you, you can get a crop the planting year. That's a big benefit. Um, all but eliminate herbicides. The hand weeding is uh, it's a piece of cake. <laughs> it's, it's really easy. And, and actually, the weeds that you get are, are seeds that blow in from surrounding fields. So if you had all your fields in this type of production and herbicide uh, around the fields to keep the seed population down, I think it would even be less. Um, there's also uh, there was a less incidence of detritus. I think it's because the plants are more out in the open and more airflow. Um, the other thing is the ease of picking. You pickers that came, they couldn't stop picking. The, the berries are laying right there, right in front of them, and uh, they just they just want to pick more. Um, and also the fruit quality is a lot better. And um, also, you, you have control of the in growing environment. Um, also, conservation of water resources and, and uh, fertilizer through the trickle irrigation fertigation system. Yeah, lots of great things there. I, I can't say that I've heard anybody say that weeding was super easy. So <laughs> that's a really nice benefit. <laughs> Yeah, and it's hard to get people to do weeding. And, and we're, trying to, we're trying to get away from herbicides. I mean, the consumers really, they want things grown more um, biologically, I guess you'd say. Um, and if you say, you know, you don't use herbicides or, or pesticides, that's a, that's a plus. And it also saves, actually, for the amount of labor for this type of system, for the weeding, it's cheaper than herbicides. Mm -hmm. another, another economic thing to look at. Yeah, awesome. I like to say that the, the only thing that you do need some herbicides is in the rows that you use to run your tractor down because uh, you know, to keep the weeds out of those rows, but, but that's just in between. Oh, okay. Well, so you leave you leave rows clear specifically for driving the tractor down. Yeah, and that was a big learning experience. <laughs> I <laughs> because bet. We, because we found that <clears throat> I tried to get the beds over over in when I, I visited a farm in Germany where they where they were doing a lot of this, and um, I think. The, the recommendation is uh, for 40 centimeters is what they like to see in the height of the beds. And unfortunately, I didn't realize that my tractor clearance um, <laughs> wasn't high enough. So we have to modify something there so you can drive the tractor down. And so maybe the rows that you're going to use for a, a, what I call a spray row um, be not as high which would be like every five rows or something. And like, cause I don't want to buy a new tractor with more clearance. Right, <laughs> that easier, was to, easier to make a couple of rows shorter than the, yeah. or lower, lower than buy a new tractor. It's just something you just didn't think about and then you, you learn things. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Okay, we have a few more questions here from the uh, audience. So Phil, I'm gonna, Throw some back to you. Um, how expensive is it to get into this type of system? Um, it's fairly expensive. Um, I guess that's kind of one of the barriers, and that's really another one of the challenges. It's just the upfront, um, the upfront cost. The capital costs are really high um, to get into it, kind of with a pre-made design. Um, unless you're going to build your own. Um, hydroponic system, it's, it, it is, there's a capital cost. So, I mean, they range, um, they range kind of all over, depending upon how many planting locations. Um, 
they're all in US dollars. They range from about probably 85,000 to 130,000 a piece okay. per farm per unit. And how much production uh, can you get out of one shipping container? Depends on the crop, obviously. Um, so it, I mean, the, the quick numbers, everyone always talks about kind of lettuce head production, just because it's easier to talk about heads and talk about weight because yeah. weight can be all over the place. Um, but like a, a farm, you can usually get, say between 700 and 1,000 head of lettuce a week. Okay, consist wow. Consistently. Um, and yeah, that's the easiest number. I mean, it really depends yeah. on what you, what you plant. And I guess you can do that all year round, so. You don't yeah, really and, have a, a season. No, no. And I mean, you can get, and that's the whole thing. It's, it gets a bit skewed if anyone's ever looked into it where people compare um, vertical farms and container growing to specific amounts of like acreage. And it's, it's all kind of just more marketing stuff because it really, it, it's, it's, it's all relative to what the growing season is and how many crops you can get out and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is, you know, some, some crops like uh, kale actually stays in the farm for, three or four months I actually okay. think I have some in the farm that's been in there for five or six months right now um, and we just keep cut it just cut and come again so we you know bring that up the track lay it on the table we we break off all the mature leaves and we leave a few leaves in the middle and every three weeks we grab that tower and it's it's regrown awesome um, what would you say are the differences between shipping container grown vegetables and field grown um, I would say the cleanliness of them is, this is just, I guess, feedback that I've gotten from people. Um, so everything's been grown indoors, you know, we're, you know, zero spray pesticide free when they're the only thing that really has touched the plants from the time of seed would be a pair of, a pair of rubber gloves to put it in a bag. Um, nice. So it's, it's, it's pretty much like they're grown in a lab. So the, the cleanliness, um, going back to kale again as well too, the, it really is a tender, a more tender crop. Um, we harvest it kind of between a, it's weird. It's not really like we harvest it between a baby and a small <laughs> kale leaf as well too. So it's, okay. it's, it's almost a bit of a different crop, but it truly is super tender. Like the chef's don't have to massage it. They kind of take that whole step out of the, the prep work. Mm. Um, and with some of the other varieties, like the, the, the lettuces, the feedback we get is, the feedback we get on almost all the crops is just that they're a bit, just a bit more, the, the taste is just a bit more intense. And I think it's because we mm. can, we grow them at, you know, the temperature that they kind of want to be grown. So I, I can grow lettuce cold um, mm -hmm. all summer and I can grow it cold to keep the head sizes small. And like, so it's, it's putting a bit more taste into the actual product is, is what, that's what they tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah, I guess it, takes it, you know, it, it, it makes sense that the plant isn't having to put up these, you know, additional defenses to wind or um, you know, herbivores using or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So it's just, a chance for those more delicate plants to really flourish. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Um, so we did, we went into one container, um, but the other container, does it also have the processing and propagating area or is it entirely production? Yeah, it's pretty much a, a mirror image. So it's the exact, mm -hmm. it's the exact same thing. Um, yeah, no, the exact same thing. So it's entirely contained within that one container from seed to harvest. It is, yeah. Awesome. Okay, let's see here. So um, Phil, I think you briefly touched on this, sorry. Um, what is the space of the containers? The, the, the entire space of the container is 300, 320 square feet um, entirely. So the grow area, you know, would be a little bit less than that in the main grow space. So I don't know, 270 feet or something like that. And do you have a rough idea of, you know, what your sort of full capacity has looked like in the past? 
Um, it depends on what I'm growing. Um, like I would say probably, like if I was completely full of lettuce, it would be maybe around 3,000, 3,500. Um, but if I was growing something that could go closer together, I could be up to 7,000 in the main grow area. Um, like if I did, if I actually counted like arugula plants, if I wanted to do that, cause I can jam those together really close. Um, and in the main, in the seeding area, like there's also an additional like 3,600 spots. So I could be, I could be, yeah, I could be growing quite a bit around the 7,500 or 8,000 range. Um, okay, I'm gonna bounce back to Jackson uh, for a minute. I'm wondering if you can comment on um, the planting density and how that differs in the systems that you're using now compared to uh, what would be like a, a usual conventional, I guess, um, planting density. Well, in this system, you have a, a high density of around 20,000 plants per acre compared to the traditional method would be like somewhere, depending on what you do, uh, five to 10,000. So it'd be way more because you don't, you're not in the traditional system, you want runners to fill in around the beds. Um, in this system, you're, you're growing individual plants. And the mm. other thing is they're all, well, for the most part, are tray plant, what they call tray plants, which are hard to get here. <laughs> well, actually, you can't get them, I don't think, in Nova Scotia. I got them from Quebec. Um, they're big plants with, oh, usually at least two crowns. So you want to get a good production the first year. And then you you cut off all the runners. You don't want runners. So you're basically growing individual plants in the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So it's all plants, I guess you could say. Right. And Jackson, maybe uh, maybe you want to touch on uh, what your experience in uh, greenhouse growing has been, because you you've kind of had the chance to experience both field growing and now the raised substrate beds um, and then also growing in the hoop house. Well, that has been a huge learning experience. I started this, I, I think the first tunnel we put in in 2015 and then we had um, more of a, a hoop house kind of thing in 2016. And this is the first year I've actually had a, a good production because of a huge learning curve. Um, Growing in, in this um, environment is totally different than outside. We're trying to do everything biologically, and that took some time to learn. We had different pests in the uh, greenhouse or, or uh, tunnel than you'd have outside, especially thrips was a big problem I never had on the outside. And so it was a matter of learning which um, biological predators, I guess you call good bugs that eat bad bugs, I call it, um, that, that would control these problems. And it, it's the same with uh, botrytis and powdery mildew. And we, we were using now a combination of some biological products for, for botrytis, which seemed to be working. And for powdery mildew, we use a sulfur burner, which is excellent and, and really inexpensive. So it's, there's a whole new way of growing uh, and, and new problems because of the environment. And also another thing that we learned when we first started, we used um, grow bags that they call their bags that are filled with a uh, combination of peak, foyer, and perlite. And we, we switched over to containers, which we found are way better. Um, and also you can reuse the containers again. The bags, you don't want to reuse the bags. We tried that, it was a big no-no. I think because salts build up in the bag. And uh, actually when I was over in, in uh, the Netherlands there where they do a lot of greenhouse production, everything's in containers. I, I never saw anybody using the grow bags. So that was another learning thing. <laughs> Neat, yeah. So do you um, disinfect the containers between 
crops? Well, this is the first year we've had them and, and you, you need to empty them and then put new substrate in and replant in the spring. There is, um, you could overwinter them and get a crop the next spring really early, but in fact, I've had strawberries there right up to the 1st of December. Oh, wow. Uh, without any heat, um, but light becomes an issue. So mm -hmm. then you have to get into a lighting system. I mean, over in the Netherlands, they grow strawberries all year round like this. I mean, it's possible, but I just didn't want to go that far <laughs> by the end. <laughs> by, by, by the end of November, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm tired. Yeah. Yeah, you need a break by this. <laughs> so, it, but it is possible to do that. You know? Yeah. No, that's very cool. It's a, that's a huge extension to your season. Yeah, and it is an extension anyway, even this way, because we can uh, grow them beyond what field grown uh, day neutrals are grown, because we don't have to worry about the frost, especially in the uh, the hoop house, which is double plastic with a blower. Mm -hmm. I, I've had temperatures down to minus seven, minus eight, and still be above freezing in, in the hoop house without any extra heat. Wow, that's awesome. So, and then that's when the, the, the price in the market's good and consumers, especially in October, where there's not much in the stores, it, it's, it's really a good market. Mm -hmm. And also we can get a really good price because people like the fact that they can stand up and pick, especially people mm -hmm. with disabilities or older people that can't bend over, you know, and get down in the field. And it, it's a really great you pick type system. And, and we're, we're getting a higher price you pick than I could get at the store already picked delivered. <laughs> so amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, what type of improvements would you like to uh, make in the future now that you're kind of into these systems? Uh, well, with the in-field one, we want to put the rows maybe a little bit farther apart. Um, because, well, especially this, the rows if you have to drive your tractor down. Um, if your tractor tire touch the ground uh, cover, then we'll pull it apart. Mm. So we need a little more space, at least on, on those rows. Um, and then we're trying to figure out the big thing right now is the amount of fertilizer, the fertigation to do on a daily basis to calculate exactly how much fertilizer that you need to put on and um, at, at what rates and how often. And, you know, mm -hmm. We're still working on that. So far, we've been doing sort of trial and error. But, you know, if you want to get down to the economics of it, you should have it refined. So. Yeah, some of that fine tuning. Fine tuning, yeah. That's... Awesome. Uh, Phil, I have the same question for you. What type of improvements uh, would you like to make in the future? Um, I still would. Um... The particular farms I'm using by Freight Farm, can, and can, can you guys hear me okay? I know that one, someone was saying they couldn't hear me. I'll, I'll put the mic a little bit closer. Um, could, could use a little bit of airflow um, help, um, just due to the, I mean, you can never have too much airflow, honestly, I think in an indoor farm. Um, that and really just expanding my growing area. So whether that's expanding to more containers or doing some custom builds. I also um, had an indoor kind of microgreens operation as well too that was separate. Um, so I more or less created a grow room that I could create a controlled environment for for that. Um, but that's about that's about it. And just uh, kind of like Jackson said, I mean, you're always just refining, um, you know, how much nutrients to use and where is that sweet spot and how like with hydroponics too it's like how long can you get out of a tank before you should completely re you know refresh that tank and all those sort of things so it's you're always watching the plants and learning and and just trying to, to maximize things and one of the interesting things that i uh we didn't get to see in the video today but you have a second uh style of tower for growing the plants in um do you want to maybe talk a bit about that that other style yeah, so recently, 
um, I started actually working with a company out of Colorado to start doing some R and D on, I guess you could call like the next generation of container farm. Um, kind of that's grown in the same style as the one that I have. Um, so yeah, when you guys were in, you could see, I, I was doing some trials on that, but there's a, there's a second type of tower that's it's, you can grow actually on both sides of it. So more plants in the container um, because you can grow on both sides. It's more or less like a, um, like the water cascades back and forth. So you don't actually plant inside of a, a, a membrane or a foam. You just drop the plugs more or less in a, in a hole that uh, allows that plug to meet the water. So it's, um, it's kind of neat. It maximizes your crops. But the other thing about the towers is that the towers are actually smaller than the ones that I grow in. Therefore, there's much more air circulation around the bases of the plants. And that's where we found that, you know, certain varieties of lettuce, if they're lying on a tower or if they're, they're tight and certain humidities and moistures, you can, you can run into problems. So we're doing trials on that. And that's, uh, that's been exciting. It's kind of, it's interesting to be part of kind of the next generation possibly of, of the container farms. Yeah, absolutely. It's cool that you get to play around with some of those newer technologies. Um, and I think one of the things we spoke about as well um, was that with the current towers that you have, sometimes there are difficulties with cleaning them um, just because they are so large and you are in a limited space. Um, ideally, you're not taking things outside of the farm. You want to try to keep it as contained as possible. But this newer style um, was easier to take apart, correct? Yeah, the newer, the newer style actually can be completely broken down. And it's also where the newer style could be broken down and you could have additional towers. So those towers could be, could be brought outside the farm and cleaned in a way that you want sanitized and then brought back in um, at whatever rotation you, you want. Um, but yeah, being, being limited in, inside the farms, it has its challenges. I mean, you know, with any sort of indoor grow, you don't want to bring anything in. Like, I mean, you, you don't want to, the last thing you want is to be able to bring in any sort of pests or any sort of pathogens. So it's, it's, it, it does have its challenges. Um, you know, that's why we do everything from seed um, as opposed to if we're doing anything from clippings and we're actually just doing it within that farm. So I'll start a basil plant um, or maybe two. And then I, if I, if I want to um, grow a second plant from, from a clipping as opposed to a seed, I'll only do it within that farm. I won't transfer it to the other farm. Yeah, and that's a pretty important thing for any sort of indoor growing is trying to, you know, maintain that clean environment. Um, and as you sort of touched on, you know, that clean start is a really good way to ensure that your space stays clean because, you know, whenever you are moving material in from somewhere else, um, you know, you could be moving in some stuff that you don't really want to and it could take a long time before you're really able to, uh, to deal with that properly. Yeah, I think uh, I've, I've mentioned this to a few different people too. I mean, it's with with vertical farming indoor farming whatever you want to call it um it's like the the weeding gets replaced with cleaning to a certain degree so you know i don't have any weeds that pop up but you know with lots of water running and light you know so i'm i'm constantly making sure that i don't have any algae anywhere mm -hmm. and you know there's definitely it's it's part of the schedule it's cleaning is cleaning is like weeding yeah Absolutely. Yeah. And a very important piece of it too. Um, so when we did visit the farm, you know, we're putting on booties, uh, we're not touching anything without gloves and that's just all part of that system to keep it clean um, and keep the plants happy. Yeah, really. I mean, with everything, but I mean, with, especially with hydroponics, I always say a clean farm is a happy farm because it's, it's not, it's not worth it. To, it's not worth it. Just, yeah, no bugs, no anything. Just stay out. Yeah. Great. Um, are you the only grower in Nova Scotia in, in this type of system, or are there others? Um, there are. I th there are, are. There aren't any other of the container farms in Nova mm -hmm. Scotia. Recently, there's one more in the province. Um, but as far as year-round growing, um, I think Denhan now down is doing cucumbers year-round, mm -hmm. and there's definitely some other some other production um, that is growing. Uh, uh, True Leaf was, was in Truro when they, they had a research facility um, growing year round. And, but as far as like, you know, small scale or medium scale commercial vertical farming, um, 
I'm one of the only ones for sure in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. Do you see room for expansion in this area? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I mean, I think just in general, you know, more people are looking to buy local um, and throughout the winter, that doesn't change type of thing. So having more options for people, um, for sure. I think there's, I think there's more room. All right, Jen has a question. Throw it over to her. Uh, I couldn't get a, a word in. There's so many interesting <laughs> questions and so much great information. So thanks very much, Bill and Jackson. Um, this is for you, Phil. I guess I was wondering, you, you've said a few times, just referring to like me, that you're doing the work. So I'm wondering how many containers do you think you could manage by yourself? Well, um, so I have had, when I jumped into this, it was just me solo. And then I hired one full-time staff, actually, when I got the second container. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of depends. It's kind of like, it's one of those things that really depends on like, what your business model, you, how you set up your business model. So it's like when I was um, growing for the restaurants, it's, it's pretty demanding. You know, it's a delivery on this day, this day, this much weight. Like it's, it's very specific. If you were doing it um, and everything was just going to the farmer's market or you had one customer that just took everything, um, it could be different because then you're just, you're able to schedule, schedule yourself in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and also depends on like the whole other side of the business, not just the planting and growing, but that whole, that whole business, <laughs> the business side, the sales side, the delivery side. Um, but to answer your question, I would say like it probably one person could do one container and then two people could do two containers or three containers or four containers. And then three people could do five containers. It's kind of like, it's, it's a bit of a staggered math and it really depends on what, what you're growing. I mean, honestly, I could, I could, um, I could set the container up that I was just growing lettuce. I could plant the whole container. I could walk away for four weeks, monitor it, come back mm -hmm. the next day, harvest the whole thing in four days, replant it and then walk away. So, I mean, I don't know. It's a weird schedule business wise, but it's like, I, it, you know, it's like it's it technically you could, you can kind of, there's a lot of different, a lot of different shapes it could become. Sure. Great. Yeah. You can kind of make it what you, what you want or what you need in that way. Awesome. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time here. So I'm just gonna check and see if anybody has any last questions or comments that they wanna make before we wrap up. Oh yeah, I got a comment I didn't touch on. It's, uh, yeah. We're trying to now to find out which substrate mix is the best, both as far as plant growth goes and the economics. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, we're really fortunate that we have a local um, substrate producer in Wedgeport, Yarmouth County, which is right mm -hmm. handy to I am, where I am, who got started in this to supply cannabis growers and is doing really well. And anyway, he's able to make any mix that we want to try and, you know, and to, to see which is the best, both for plant growth and the economics. Mm. the economics is a big part of it to do to do this system it, it probably to get it set up to start is probably around thirty thousand dollars an acre and the, the two major costs are the substrate and the plants mm. so that's something that needs to be looked at more yeah that'll be interesting to to follow your experience with over over the next while. And great that there's a local a local producer actually, or a local supplier. Because we did a trial the year before and we got all the substrate from the Netherlands, which mm. you can imagine shipped to Montreal and then trucked down here. I mean, the cost <laughs> is really high. And I was just so lucky that um, this out growing green they're called, um, it, it really helped a lot. Yeah, awesome. 
I, I have a quick question for Jackson. Just wondering if he's ever if he's ever tried any hydroponic production. Well, I don't know if he, it's strictly hydroponic. Well, it, it sort of is, but I mean it's in substrate. Yep. In the uh, well, both in that we're doing now in the field and in the uh, and in the uh, greenhouse uh, tunnel. And you know the big thing is water quality, pH. EC, it all has to be monitored, but it's not, you know what I mean? It's still in a, I, I don't know if it, it's sort of semi hydroponic, I guess you'd call it. Um, yep. But yeah, I was just know, curious. It has to be monitored really carefully. But, yeah, um, I was just curious what the, what the benefit was of, of having the substrate if you were able to get all those, the, the EC and the pH bang on, um, like kind of in a, in a closed loop system. But, uh, I, I don't, it, it's not really a huge problem, but we, I learned a lot when I went over to the Netherlands. We had a session afterwards, and um, one of the things I learned was um, that at every watering, you should have a discharge. And, and when the temperature goes up, the discharge should be almost as high as 30%. To, I, I guess, to get the salt, so, to keep the EC down. That, that's the big thing. And uh, what we do now is um, every, once a day, we um, flush the system with just straight water to clear it out. And that seems to be working really well. Uh, yeah, I've even noticed that in my system. It's, it's, in, it's amazing. Um, <laughs> it's amazing how happy plants are in a fresh, in a fresh system. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it really helps a lot. And uh, the the whole fertigation system's on a timer with uh, injectors. We use calcium nitrate, and then uh, I use Eco Plus, which I can get from Cavendish, uh, combined with Epsom salts. That's okay. The combination we use. But I think flushing it out once a day is a really good thing, and then also try like once a week flush all the lines out. And uh, we use uh, Eco uh, or um, Zero tall peroxide thing. One of the one of the problems I see though in the troughs is you can get a buildup of algae. And I'm not sure we're trying to use some peroxide or something try to control that a little bit. Yeah, zero tall seems to be the yeah zero tall is really good. Yeah. yeah, and then to clean the uh, at the end of the season we uh, pressure wash everything and then. Um, Hose it down with sanitate, which yeah. is a little stronger. You know? Yeah, I'm using the same. Yeah, the same. yeah, it's a good product. Are you uh, are you using any um, uh, like root shield or anything as yeah. well too in your system? Right. Well, all the plants we dip in root shield before we start, and uh, then we then we're using that as uh, as part of the also spraying it on, I have overhead sprayers in one, and we use that in that too. That's a really good, another good product. Yeah. Or yeah. just uh, the, uh, what's it, trianium, the, the main component of it, you can get that also. I get every, all that stuff from Copperts in Ontario, they're really good. But yeah, dipping the plants when you start, you know, I guess it's trying to build immunity, some immunity up in the plant itself to protect it from botrytis is our big concern. Yeah. Someone described it to me once as like uh, when you dip the plants, it's almost like a, it's a parking lot. It, it takes up all the parking spots where the, where the bad bacteria can, yeah. can land and then it, it just has to go somewhere else. So I like that analogy. The other thing I learned when I was over in the Netherlands uh, uh, for as far as mold, uh, you know, botrytis is uh, air, uh, humidity to get to keep the humidity down as low as you can because um, that just if you have high humidity you're going to have more incidence of disease so we try to keep the fans going every day you know and stuff like well like you mentioned you know a lot of ventilation <laughs> yeah more better. Yeah, especially in a year like this when it's been so humid, <laughs> yeah, that ventilation yeah. is key. And, you know, this is another thing that's happening. I think climate change is, is going to play a big role in how we uh, do things. You know, we have yeah, to adapt absolutely. to it. And we're getting 
cold, wet springs and hot, dry summers. And it's a, you know, I've been doing it while I started in back in the 80s, and I, I can't believe how the climate has changed. Mm. Yeah, I think we're going to. That's actually why we went to raised beds initially is because then we had uh, you know, this root rot problem. And it's getting worse, actually. Mm. Last, uh, wasn't uh, this spring, but the spring before, I measured uh, 750 millimeters of rain from the middle of April to the end of June. Wow. Un unbelievable, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think uh, we're going to see, keep seeing a lot more of these kind of new and alternative systems um, in order to make the most out of our growing season and, and be resilient in the face of climate change. So I want to uh, thank you all for being here today, our excellent uh, guest speakers, Phil and Jackson, as well as our specialists, Jen and Talia, and our uh, background producer, Rachel, from our marketing team. Um, thank you all for joining us. And just a reminder, we do have one more virtual field day. So join us tomorrow at noon for um, weed management in hort crops. All right, thank you very much.